this is designed, <laughs> this is designed as a very interactive event in nature. If you'd like to say hello, we'd love for you to drop your name and where you're joining us from in the chat. And before we begin, I'd just like to go through some guidelines for Zoom functionality today. First, if you haven't already, please change your name since many of you joined from a default link that had someone else's name in it. Second, if you can, please keep your microphone on mute except when you are speaking. Third, feel free to keep your video on if you feel comfortable as it builds a sense of community, especially for our speakers. Fourth, we will be spotlighting our panelists and speakers today. So please feel free to use the speaker view, which you can adjust at the top right corner of your screen if you would like to see the speakers only. And fourth, I'd like to remind you that again, this event is being recorded and will be available for viewing afterwards. So I'll pass it on to Sophia to share a little bit about a fun raffle we're having. Hi everyone, thanks so much to Celine for kicking us off. Um, just wanted to let you know that we are doing a raffle um, that's raising money towards Actu and Racism and also Hua Foundation. And Teresa uh, with us today is a part of Actu and Racism. I'm just gonna quickly share some slides. I'll go into a bit more details about the raffle. Give me one moment. Does everybody see my slides? Yep. So if you go here, there are um, a few different options on how you can win. There's these prizes you see up on screen right here are all available to be won in the Vancouver area only because shipping is not available. We have face masks, cinnamon buns, accessories, photography sessions, and more. And if you go down um, to here, these ones are available to be won anywhere across Canada and the USA. So shipping is available for a wide variety of places, face masks, shoes from Vessi, glow sticks, leggings, you name it. And there's over $2,000 worth of prizes that you can win. Um, so instructions on how to enter is quite easy. You can go on the Threading Change Instagram. I will also be posting all this information in the chat so you can see. Again, all proceeds will be donated to three organizations working to combat anti-Asian racism. And there's also a chance to win a mystery bundle. And if you comment on the pictures of the Instagram photos, you can get entered to win for those. For the raffle tickets, for the 11 other baskets, you have to pay a $10 uh, per ticket to enter. So if you you know, donate $50, that's five raffle tickets, et cetera. And you can also indicate which bundles you're interested in donating. And um, with that, I'll be posting information in the chat. Thank you so much to everyone who's interested. On to you, Celine. Thanks, Sophia. We hope you'll enter. There's so much incredible gifts being given to organizations. Let's support them and organizations who are doing incredible work. With that all being said, now we'll get into it. I'd like to pass the mic on to Annie Wang. She is the co-founder, chief product officer, and creative director of Her Campus Media. She'll be moderating our panel today. Great. Thank you, Celine, for that kind introduction. Um, so to give you guys a little bit more background on who I am, again, my name is Annie Wang. Um, I'm joining you guys all the way from the United States, um, currently based in Ohio here. Um, and I'm the co-founder, chief product officer, and creative director of Her Campus Media, which is a media portfolio of brands um, for college and Gen Z women. So I have the pleasure of being your moderator today for today's panel. And I'm so glad to be here um, with all of you uh, as today's topic is obviously so important and timely today. And it's something that we, um, as the Asian community at large across North America are facing together. Um, as we all know, the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes since the pandemic started has been extremely dangerous and frightening and disheartening for all of us um, in these communities. And though I have fortunately not been a victim of a hate crime myself, it has been really tough waking up every single day to new headlines of these crimes happening against people just like me and many of you. Um, people who could be my siblings, my parents, my neighbors, my grandparents, and it just really hits really close to home. Um, but I think that in these times of crisis and tragedy, sometimes it's unclear how to move forward productively um, and how to really take action. And um, that's why I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be here on this panel and to learn from our fellow panelists today who have really dedicated their careers to advancing justice in a myriad of ways. And I know we'll have so much to learn from them. 
Um, so as a reminder, please do drop your questions in the chat because we will have time for audience Q&A at the end after we go through our prepared questions um, in the second half of today's panel. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to our panel of esteemed speakers who really represent a diversity of voices and experiences. So first up, we have Amy Go. Welcome, Amy. Amy is the president of the Chinese Canadian National Council for Social Justice, an organization that educates, engages, and advocates for social justice and equity for all in Canada. A social worker by training, Amy has spent over three decades advocating for social justice and the rights of women and racialized communities uh, through her leadership role in national, provincial, and local service and advocacy organizations. Welcome, Amy. Uh, next, we have Hanru Zhou. Hanru is an associate professor of public law at the University de Montreal Faculty of Law. Um, before joining the law faculty, he served as a law clerk to Justice Marie Deschamps at the Supreme Court of Canada. A member of the Quebec Bar, Han Rougeau also practiced as a corporate lawyer at a Canadian law firm. He received his legal education at Montreal, Harvard, and Oxford universities. He also studied classical piano at the Conservatory of Music of Montreal. Welcome. And last but not least, we have Teresa Wu Pa. Um, Teresa is a tireless advocate for diversity, social inclusion, and active civic participation. She is known for her ability to bring diverse people together to joint efforts, to break new ground, and create bigger impacts in society. She is the first Canadian woman of Asian descent elected to the Calgary Board of Education, the Alberta Legislature, and Cabinet Minister in Alberta. So welcome, Teresa, Hanru, and Amy. I'm so happy to have you here to speak with us and share your wisdom. Um, and with that, let's get into the questions. Um, so first of all, uh, and anyone can really chime in to answer these questions, just to set the foundation for today's panel. Let's start with this question. What is anti-Asian racism and how is it different from other forms of racism? Maybe I'll start. <laughs> So first of all, I just want to acknowledge that I'm in, located in Toronto, which is also, of course, indigenous land, and it is home to many uh, diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. It is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of Credit, the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa, Chippewa bands. So... Um, I, you know, that many people have asked us about, you know, what is anti-Asian racism? And we like to highlight a number of things. Uh, first of all, um, the anti-Asian racism that we have been trying to highlight in the last year or so during this pandemic primarily addresses the East and Southeast Asian communities. Um, and, and I think it is important to point that out and because Asia is a very diverse um, place on, you know, in the world and people, there are various um, uh, nations, countries, you know, cultural uh, affiliations, as well as of course, spiritual practices. So we cannot, you know, um, not, not undermine and not speak to that diversity. And in fact, one of the things that we realized in under this anti-Asian racism uh, issue is, the, is treating us as monolithic, that all Asians are the same. It is definitely not true. We are very diverse. We come from very different backgrounds. Many of us have been generations in Canada, fourth and fifth generations and others are newcomers. Second of all, that I like to highlight is that this model minority myth um, Asian Canadians and similar to Asian Americans, right? In fact, that model minority myth, that whole, this whole, you know, stereotype, you know, came from the states as part of the civil rights movement as a way of white privilege to divide and conquer racialized groups, particularly pitting one group against, of course, the African-Americans and the black Americans. And so in this case, it's very similar, this multi minority myth that came to Canada and really pitting us against the others, you know, and of course, really impacted on Asian Canadian community as well, that we are seen as submissive, we are seen as, you know, uh, always good in math as you know and and being 
good scientists and musicians, you know, and everybody. In fact, one of our Supreme Court justices has said that all all, all Chinese play, you know, like Yo Yo Ma, which is so not true. Of course, I'm, you know, I've had Professor Joe is one of the example. However, there are many uh, like me would not be able to claim that. So I think it's important to highlight that model minority myth. And the other thing is that that we are always seen as perpetual foreigners. The day that we landed in the 1800s, you know, from China being served in, as laborers to build a railway and Japanese Canadians coming to work in the farms and all that. The day that we landed since, you know, that for all the hundreds of years, we are still seen as perpetual foreigners and we are always being told to go back to China. So go back to Asia, go back to where we're from. And those I think needs to be highlighted and how we see that different from other forms of racism. And I will let my other uh, fellow speakers. Yes, um, thank you. Um, and thank you, thanks to the uh, organizers for uh, putting together this uh, event and for uh, having me on this uh, panel with uh, my much, uh, my much more distinguished uh, panelists. Um, um, and I have to admit uh, right uh, from the outset that I actually don't play like Yo-Yo Ma, so <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I don't, uh, uh, um, Annie, this is a, an important question you asked uh, that goes to the heart of you know, a subfield of uh, critical studies uh, and uh, to the, the work of uh, many professionals uh, in their communities. So I, I, very briefly, I, I don't wanna uh, hear uh, muddle uh, their message. Uh, as we all know, uh, Asian Canadians, uh, uh, Asian Canadian communities uh, have been the target of, of racism pretty much since they first set foot uh, in this country. Uh, it's important to uh, educate and uh, speak out against uh, all its manifestations. Uh, as well as manifestations of systemic discrimination that adversely impacts uh, on all minorities, including Asian uh, Canadians. But uh, I think we'll have uh, more opportunities to, uh, to discuss that today. So I'll, I'll just stop here. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just um, chimp in and, uh, and speak briefly because I think that um, uh, I think the previous uh, speaker uh, have provided a really good, um, I, I think, uh, definition. So I'd just like to perhaps remind us that uh, racism includes uh, ideas and practices that um, establish, maintain and perpetuate the racial superiority or dominance of one group over another. So uh, as Asian Canadians, uh, 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 you know, uh, racism towards us is, uh, you know, forms of prejudice, stereotyping and discrimination that's directed at people of Asian descent uh, with our unique experience. I think, uh, you know, some of those um, um, Amy have, um, uh, you know, uh, referenced to. Now, I just want to say that um, um, uh, it is also uh, the, the form of um, uh, racism is manifested uh, associated with our social identity, our particular social identity, our history. Uh, for, for, for me, is the Chinese head tax that actually had a direct impact on my family for generations, uh, the yellow peril sentiment and other social factors that comes into play. So I think that the intersectionality is important to recognize here uh, that uh, contribute to shaping this particular phenomenon and cause different impacts and experiences. Um, and, uh, and thank you for actually starting with this question, because both Amy and I have spoken on this, that uh, how uh, dismayed we are that uh, Asian anti-Asian racism have been omitted uh, in all levels of government in this country, in all of the anti-racism policies. So I think that is also a unique form of racism that have to be now defined and recognized. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa, for calling that out. I think that's a perfect segue into the next question. Um, what can we say to folks, you know, who believe that racism is not as common in Canada or that Asian Canadians don't really experience it? Like, what is that experience really like? And maybe um, giving some examples of your personal lived experiences or what you have observed in, uh, in your life. I'll start, I'll try to be brief, uh, because I think that, um, you know, I have done different things in my life, like uh, Amy, I'm, I'm, I'm also, so I have a social work background, have done different things uh, over the past 40, 45 years. But the last 12 months actually uh, have been, have 
pushed me to reflect on the thing, a lot of things that actually I have not actually dealt with or think about or uh, talk about. So, uh, so because this afternoon I'll be actually uh, facilitating a, a webinar to launch our video on the yellow peril. And, uh, you know, uh, after I won my first election in 1995 to become a school board trustee, someone took time, the effort to write me a letter to call me the yellow peril. So merely a school board trustee trying to address some issues for students and immigrant families. So people actually took time to call me a yellow peril. And then a month later, actually a student teacher uh, came to tell me, Teresa, you have to work extra hard because a lot of parents don't see you, uh, someone like you can represent them. And then at my first labor negotiation meeting, I was uh, sitting at the table and I said that, well, I don't really see myself, you know, um, uh, as a trustee, as a part of management. I really see myself as uh, the voice for parents and students and the community. And uh, so, and then someone actually challenged me at the table and said, well, I don't know whether all the people who voted for you were Chinese. So I think that um, uh, those are actually uh, things I experienced as an elected official. Uh, speaking of um, uh, you know, personal experience, then there are many, unfortunately. But I just like to say that for those who are actually questioning this, I think the evidence are clear. Uh, historically, contemporarily, and recently, so many recorded facts. Of course, 80% of the people who experience racism do not report. But then you know what is also significant, whether ready or not, most of our institutions have acknowledged the existence of racism and systemic racism. So I would focus, of course, the public education engagement would always be part of the work. But I think I would focus on what is it that we can actually do now together to actually address uh, systemic racism, to remove the barriers so that we can be the kind of inclusive society that Canada aspire to. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I, I can go. Um, um, uh, to your question, uh, Annie, uh, I, I, I may have a, a, a personal and perhaps more pr pragmatic uh, approach, and these are tentative thoughts. Uh, for me, at least, uh, a, a necessary condition uh, to consider engaging in such a conversation is that the other person holds such false belief uh, in good faith and has an open mind. Uh, if not, then you know, I, I want to ask myself, uh, is it worth my time? Uh, we can't be uh, a part of every fight. We you know, got to choose uh, ours. Uh, and so uh, if I still want to engage uh, uh, into that conversation, I, I'll, I'll, I, I imagine I'll, I'll, I would start by uh, inquiring about the other people, the other person's posture, right? Why does the, pe the person hold that belief uh, based on what? Uh, what do they think about racism uh, in general? And uh, so I think the most information I have, the better I'll know what to say, uh, the better I'll know how to adapt uh, 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 my um, uh, ideas and arguments uh, to, in order to have a, a useful uh, conversation. So these are my thoughts. Just want to quickly add to what Teresa and uh, Professor Joanne said. The in the last year, Chinese Canadian National Council Toronto chapter, as well as Project 1907 in Vancouver, have collected uh, from March to February 1150 cases of incidents reported by individual who either experienced them themselves or witnessed, you know, racist taunt all the way from verbal taunting to physical assaults. Um, most of these actually were experienced by women, and most of them were targeted seniors as well as younger people under the age of 18. So if you look at 18, 1100, and at the time, I think the American stats, it's like 2800, you know, so, you know, so we always use those stats, right? If America is like 10 times, you have a 10 times more in population than Canada, you should be at like, well, for us, it's like 11,000 cases, right? And as Teresa said, 80% of cases are not even reported. So there is just so much more actually aggressive brazen racist attacks during this last year in Canada, and we should definitely not be sort of complacent and not be proud that we have this multicultural and kind, you know, Canadian demeanor, you know, in society, which is that's definitely not, not true. At the same time, I think the whole pandemic, as it's Teresa said, 
led all Asian Canadians to reflect on their lives and their personal life, as you have said, Annie, that in fact, when we are talking to parents, seniors, children, as well as professionals and workers, every single person has a story to tell, has a story to tell like Teresa. You know, as a story to tell about racist bullying growing up in Canada, in Toronto, in Prairie, in a small town or big cities. Every person a story to tell of being uh, of being shunned or marginalized, and especially women. Even you know, women were treated as secretaries because you're Asians, you're women, you know, and treated as nannies because you're Asian, you're, you know, and these are professional settings, right? So there is not only these racist, blatant races that, you know, uh, racist attacks that Teresa mentioned that we are unfortunately have all experienced in the last year in particular, there's all these microaggressions that is just taking a toll on so many of us. And that's why this last year, in a way it's called like a triggering you know, it's like a post-traumatic for all of us. So we're so fearful, not only for our safety, but the parents, but our seniors, as well as our children. And, and everybody just hug ourselves and really got together because of this sort of like, you know, this trauma that collectively Asian Canadians are experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. That's so, so important, Amy. Thank you for speaking on that. I think that's been so true for myself too. This last year, like we've all said, has been this like terrible awakening and reckoning of our own history, you know, the, my history that I don't know as well as I should, right? So I think this has been a moment of self-reflection and education for each of us as well in this community. And um, it's horrifying to see these statistics of these crimes, but Part of that as well is us learning to use our voice and report on these things that we've typically, you know, historically maybe not found the voice to, to really give voice to. So um, thank you for, for calling attention to that. So with our next question, I want to talk about intersectionality and allyship as well. So how should we be paying attention to those values of intersectionality and allyship when it comes to addressing anti-Asian racism? Okay, um, perhaps, yeah, perhaps I can go first uh, this time. Um, yes, uh, thanks, Annie, for, for that question, which is a, you know, a, a central part, I think, uh, in the fight against racism and, and should be a, a, a unifying theme. Um, society tends to uh, put, you know, uh, everything, everybody in, in, in categories, right? Black, Asian, um, Muslim, refugees, LGBTQ+, uh, etc. Uh, and sometimes there are people uh, who used it uh, as a wedge uh, by instrumentalizing one community against another, right? This is uh, what uh, Amy referred to right at the beginning of today's panel. And uh, one case uh, on point that comes to mind is uh, the affirmative action uh, cases. You're probably all aware of the, the Harvard admission uh, uh, cases uh, 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 in which one of the strategies of the adversaries of the affirmative action uh, of affirmative action uh, was to use uh, Asian Americans by saying that Asian students had been discriminated uh, by those elite universities in favor of some other races, and therefore uh, affirmative action programs should be banned. Right? Fortunately, in Canada, um, uh, we have more comprehensive equality rights uh, than the US and uh, our laws protect affirmative uh, action programs. Uh, but still, uh, we, uh, we have a long way to go uh, here as well. Um, the problem, uh, in my view, is that many people uh, have a narrow understanding of what equality is, even judges. For a lot of people, equality means you get something, I must get the same thing. Uh, if you don't, and I do because of my race, then these people think it's discrimination. And sometimes that's false, right? Uh, it's always a matter of justification of uh, the differential treatments. So the takeaway, I think, is that, you know, minority groups, we're all in it together. Uh, we also got to look out for one another, Asian or non-Asian. Uh, the ultimate goal here, I think, uh, 
should be achieving substantive uh, equality. Yeah, thank you for making that point, Hanru. I think, you know, you hit on something important, which is um, when we think about equality, we're often thinking about the inputs of treating everyone the same. And now we're starting to have a, a more nuanced understanding with equity, right, being the, the goal um, of equal outcomes, right? And so I think uh, maybe some of the panelists will speak about this as well, but thank you for calling attention to that. I think that is at the heart of a lot of that and kind of goes back to what we've been talking about with the model minority myth and how, you know, treating the entire Asian community as a monolith is just, um, is a really big problem because, you know, especially in the United States where we actually see the Asian uh, community as the most, um, with the most income inequality actually among all racialized groups in the United States. And that's something that a lot of people don't know. And so thinking about our population as one um, is really hampering to uh, efforts to really address the inequities in the system. So, but anyway, enough from me. Um, Amy, Teresa, anything to add to this point about intersectionality and um, allyship before we go into the questions for each of you individually? Uh, maybe very, very, very briefly. Um, these are big topics. These are important subjects. Uh, I think what I would like to add is that, uh, you know, the, the components, the, um, the markers for, uh, to consider intersectionalities uh, include race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, class, education, uh, and, uh, and citizenship, right? And uh, so uh, I think it's important for all of us as we, uh, you know, continue our journey uh, to become more aware, to become better al ally ourselves, uh, to dedicate our work to, uh, to create a more inclusive society. We have to understand this the sources of power. So who has who yield power? Who have power? You know, in relation to those identities, and then and then also to become more uh, clear, aware about the kind of power you have, and uh, and perhaps the kind of power that we collective don't have, and uh, and how do we work with that, right? And how do you exercise your power? And any you use the word to use your voice. So I think that uh, all of us have to be, you know, have to be aware of the kind of power we have and don't have, and how do we actually address that in our work. So just very quickly add to what has been said. The one thing about this last year is that I've been on Chinese media quite a few times, and many of them actually have asked about, so we see all these random and, of course, brazen attack against Asians. Shouldn't us as Chinese and Asian communities be more than reflective of how we treat the Black communities, right? Look at what George Floyd incidents, look at all the 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 hate that the that we have um, that black communities have been have been subjected to that Asian walking on the street you know is now being a potential target but black men particular historically and it's for generations have been living with that kind of reality so I think it this in a way you know I've never heard any kind of progressive voices from the Chinese media, I'm sorry to say, but at least some of them are like recognizing, hmm, you know, that this may lead us to even think about, as Teresa said, our own privilege, our power, you know, and how we work in solidarity with other communities and anti-Black, to, to combat anti-Black racism, to, of course, to, to address misogyny, sexism, and working in solidarity with the LGBTQ. I mean, Asian communities definitely are not immune to discrimination against sexual uh, minorities and gender minorities. Um, there are lots of rallyings against when there was the same sex education being proposed in Ontario. Lots of the people in the rally, unfortunately, are from Asian Canadian background. So all these really have that I hope would call us out and also make us reflect our own privilege and our own discrimination and our and how, what we can do to combat that. Great, thank you, Amy. So we'll now move into um, individual questions for each of our panelists. And again, as a reminder, please do drop in your questions for them as well. We'll get to those in just a couple minutes here. So would love to see your questions dropped in the chat so that we can hear from all of you and what you're wondering about today. Um, so we'll start with you, Amy. 
Um, so now let's shift into sort of like policy and what we can do really to, to take action now. So what are some effective policy advocacy strategies that you've seen to address anti-Asian racism successfully? So as we all know, policy changes are it's sort of like this long haul journey, right? Nothing, there's not a, you know, Teresa and I have worked in these for decades and it took us so many years to even get redressed for Chinese Exclusion Act and attacks. Um, and so it, it, it does take a lot of uh, ground grassroots organizing and of course reaching out to the people in power and all that. Just to give you two examples that I've seen, at least to see some positive changes that actually Teresa mentioned one. The, the, our national strategy, anti-racism strategy for let's say 2019, 2022 did not mention anti-Asian racism. And this whole last year has really awakened, you know, many of us that there is anti-Asian racism. So through the advocacy of many groups like, you know, Teresa and ours and other really push for it. So finally, the government is will include a definition or a recognition of that, which I think is a positive thing. And it is really that solidarity building, working across, you know, nationally with many, many uh, organizations to, to build that and to put pressure on the government. The other thing that I also see is the the, the, the use of desegregated data and in fact, the promotion and enhancement of that. So we are again, you know, groups such as Color of Poverty and Color of Change has been calling for desegregated data for like, you know, 10 years, because they've been around 10 years, but, you know, and in the last year in particular that, you know, we see the pandemic has differentially impacted on racialized communities, but we also see that there is a lack of data not only in public health, in our healthcare sector and across the sectors. So the what we are also seeing that, hey, there is now more receptive acceptance or receptiveness, you know, from Stats Canada, as well as, you know, Canadian Institute of Health Information, CAIHI, now trying to build standards around race-based disaggregated data. So again, these are, again, years of lobbying, years of work from community groups, as well as, of course, solidarity movement across not only Asian Canadian communities. The use of disag has been pushed and pushed by Black communities, by in indigenous communities for years. And finally, we are seeing some movement. So those are just two examples that I would like to raise. Thank and you. there, and this is, first of all, this is only the beginning baby step. There's still, you know, even when we're looking at the proposal, it's really not really what we are, that we would, you know, think it's like the best practices or evidence-informed practices in healthcare. But at least it's a baby step towards hopefully, hopefully advance that equity outcome that we want to have. Amy, if you don't mind, I would love to ask a follow up question to that. So you mentioned baby steps. And I think some of us on this call are wondering what is the first baby step I can take? You know, maybe I'm not in this field like mm -hmm. you are. What is something that we can do very practically to get involved and make a difference? Right, right. So I see particularly in the last year, uh, the young people like you are coming forward, right? Use social media. You are very good. And in fact, please, please use social media to, to advance these understanding, right? Uh, why do we need race-based data? Why do we need to advance, you know, policies to change the systemic in, in disparities, right? So use the platform and use the voices that, as Teresa said, that you have. And in fact, we are seeing, we are seeing influencers from social media doing that. And so the problem I find with social media, because the engagement is so brief, right? It's so brief. It's like people are, have to have this like two minutes, the most kind of, you know, so hopefully, you know, that if more and more of us are doing this and more and more of us are advancing this kind of understanding, this kind of systemic nature of the racism that we are talking about, then, you know, collectively there will be an impact. So yes, use your voice, use the platform that you have, use social media effectively, get to learn these issues. And I think we have hope because the hope is in you, all these young people. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That's so encouraging as somebody, you know, who is in, so, in the world of social media, it's good to know that that is, you're seeing that that's making an impact. And I, I see that in my community too, my friends who are not Asian, people are making an effort to diversify their feeds, to educate themselves. It's really important. So it's super encouraging to know that those small little actions that 
we have in our control can make a difference. Thank you. Um, okay, over to you, Hanru. So I have a question for you. Um, it can be challenging at times to see Asian Canadians in positions of leadership. Um, how can we take action to change this reality as young professionals? So now thinking, you know, in our workplaces, what can we do to sort of change that and and see more representation for Asians in positions of leadership? Yeah. Uh, well, the way I'm I'm thinking about the question is is first of all, well, as and thinking about you know our our our, uh, our participants is that you know as as young professionals. Uh, you guys are right the next generation of Asian Canadian leaders, or you already are leaders in your community, uh, but the best is still to come, right? Um, and so thinking about that, you know, I, 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 I have perhaps two related suggestions uh, in mind. Uh, it might seem obvious, but you know, I'll let you be uh, the judge, right? Uh, one is um, well help each other, right? Um, you know, we can't make it on our own. Uh, there's actually research uh, that shows that, that the, those who help out more are more successful in their career and make better leaders. I take that from uh, Adam Grant's book, uh, Give and Take. Uh, although Grant makes some nuances, um, if you haven't read it, uh, I highly recommend. Um, uh, and second is, uh, well, you know, uh, we need all the help we can get, right? So help yourself uh, and reach out. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's uh, it's second nature, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, I teach hundreds of uh, undergraduate and graduate students uh, every year, and I'm amazed uh, at how hardly anyone uh, reaches out to me or my colleagues for anything besides exams. Um, even, even among those uh, that I know personally, um, I don't know, maybe I don't present myself uh, the right way, uh, but uh, I believe there are lots of us out there who are more than happy uh, to be of use. Um, and obviously, you know, there are in, like in all professional interactions and relationships, there are ways to reach out. But I would say that you know, in any event, it's worth trying. Worst case scenario, uh, you don't get a response. Thank you for those great ideas, Hanru. Uh, we do have quite a few questions coming in through the chat, so keep those coming. Um, in the meantime, we'll go over to Teresa for your question. Um, it feels like there's more attention being paid right now, uh, this year in particular, to Asian Heritage Month, which is the month of May in the wake of the rise in anti-Asian violence. How do we continue to maintain this momentum in celebrating the accomplishments and contributions of Asian Canadians and drawing light to the unique challenges that they face? That's why I tried not to mute myself. Okay, so this is actually, this year marks the 20th, uh, uh, 20th anniversary for Canada's official recognition of Asian Heritage Month. And uh, it actually Asian Heritage Month originated in the United States in the 70s. Uh, and uh, you know, it was proposed by a, a congressman of Japanese descent. Uh, and, uh, and it was from the very beginning, and I believe until now, that the key, one of the key objective purpose of Asian Heritage Month is to actually to, to examine issues and policies that continue to impact and of concern to Asian Canadians and Asian Americans. So I think it's very important for all of us to always keep that in mind. It is an opportunity to foster greater awareness about our participation, contribution, and, and our heritage, but it's very much about talking about issues that uh, of concern to us. So I think uh, we, we have to remember that. And, and for myself who have been involved in organizing Asian Heritage Month as a mean to social change, I want to engage iconic institutions in my community, be it the orchestra, be it the library, be it the Calgary Stampede, be it the uh, you know, uh, iconic institutions to engage them, to actually look at how we are not part of their, their you know, environment 
uh, and uh, and use Asian Heritage Month as a way to engage, uh, 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 you know, institutions and claim our space, right? So, um, uh, so I just like to share just a little bit of that. You know, we've done different things like find the can Asian in you. If you actually had Vietnamese noodles or use chopsticks this month or had sushi, uh, then there's a little bit of Asian in you. So we want to actually connect people. So to me, Asian Heritage Month is about community, is about uh, connection, is about social change. Uh, and um, um, I think, how do we actually keep the momentum? I think that um, you know, this year in Calgary, the city of Calgary is involved, the Calgary Foundation is involved, uh, and um, the university is involved. I think that part of what we should be doing is to continue that conversation and engagement. Uh, I think that's one level. Uh, the other is that um, we really uh, have to make, uh, help, help to help people understand Asian Heritage Month is much more. Uh, it is about an opportunity to deepen uh, uh, all of our understanding and appreciation on how Asian Canadians have been and continue to be builders and contributors uh, of our country, Canada, uh, and uh, to recognize the resilience, uh, how we have overcome barriers and, uh, and our resolve in ensuring that Canada is the kind of inclusive society that, um, that uh, it envisioned. So how do you do that? Is, you know, you, uh, you start with building our capacity, right? We need capacity to do things. And then you try to use different opportunities to organize formal and informal civic participation for yourself, for your membership, and for the community that you, you focus on. Uh, and then you try to move on to actually engaging the public, raising public awareness about your issues and concerns and bring them along and help them understand why diversity is important why it's uh, beneficial for all Canadians. And then with that, with public support, then you, you try policy change, right? Like Amy said. So, uh, and uh, policy change and institutional change. Those are sustainable changes, right? Because we don't want one off anymore. We cannot keep talking and then do not see change. We cannot actually keep seeing the same kind of numbers in reports decades after decade and not see change. We have to demand change and we have to be part of that change. And I, you know what? Uh, I think that you are on your way to be part of that change. You are showing your capacity. You are organizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, civic in, uh, activities. You're taking civic action. And uh, so I think that building on the previous speakers, um, I think that, um, uh, you know, maybe when the pandemic is over, uh, make greater connection with the impact of community. Uh, so that you know how these things are really hurting people, how it's hurting children, how it's hurting people in the community. And I think that's going to sustain you and maintain your drive to do this year after year, decade after decade. It will become part of your narrative and your mission. Thank you. Beautifully said, Teresa. Thank you so much. I think that's so important. Is just like you said that it's not a one-off thing that just happens this month. I think a lot of organizations are paying attention to it. The media is paying attention to it now. But how can we be proactive and, as you said, like weave this into the fabric of our lives so it's not just this one month thing? Great. So we have some questions to go into from the audience. I'll start with the first one here. What are some examples of intersectionality that can be applied to practicing solidarity with the Asian community? So for example, Amy mentioned understanding the struggles of the Black community in America. I, you know, I would uh, just want to expand on what I just said and, and hopefully it's a helpful advice. And because a lot of young people have come forward and say, we want to help, we want to do something. And I would actually encourage each one of us to think about what do you like to do, right? Each one of us has an interest and depending on, first of all, you want, do you want something to be done in your workplace? Do you want something to, to be done according to your interest? It could be a leisure activity that you've always engaged in. But it, because as Teresa said, change has to come everywhere. Change has to come in your workplace, in your school, in your whatever activities that you are engaging in. So look at those opportunities 
that you have, right? Be it in your school, be it in your workplaces and see what can you do to, to advance that change? What opportunities? Of course, we recognize that privileges and position of power and all that, right? But how each one of us can do that. And even just start with a little thing that you do on your daily basis. Even let's say if you are a professional doing this kind of work, in your work, how can you advance that understanding of oppression, of racism that impacts and you know on, on different communities, including Asian community, and impact on um, the of, of uh, women of color, of uh, of LGBTQ, you know, so and, and black community, so and the indigenous rights issue, right? So think of that. To me, every opportunity, everything that we do has an element of that and can be improved. So, you know, and take that analysis and see, okay, where, how can I do? How can I advance this change in the little sphere that I have? Can I build allyship in my workplace? You know, can I gather my st fellow students in this class? Can I gather, or if I have a book club, you know, if I have a, uh, a music uh, program, you know, how can we advance that beyond my little circle and extend that with, again, the analysis to, to me is that framework of anti-racism, anti-oppression, which is the most important framework that we can apply to and, and, and leap from there and, and spring them. Because if you are not engaging in something that you are interested in, you lose interest, you, you know, you would, you would lose your attention right away. So find something that you are passionate about, do something about that and you can, you can advance that change. Great. I have a question for Han Ru now. This one came in, um, really interesting question. Uh, as illustrated by a recent Washington Post article, the highest levels of the Canadian judiciary are still quite racially homogenous. Can you tell us about initiatives in the legal community that are working to move the needle on making the judicial system more diverse? Right. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I mean, if things are moving, um, they're moving very slowly. Um, at least, uh, you know, if you're following the, the 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 news at Supreme Court level, they're in the process of appointing uh, a new uh, a new judge. So we'll know we'll we'll know pretty soon if. Uh, uh, um, there'll be a, there'll be a first in the in the history of our uh, of our court. Um, uh, certainly, uh, um, efforts have uh, are intensified in the uh, past uh, few years. Uh, at least uh, 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 there are more and more talks uh, about it, uh, which is you know better than nothing, and which is better than what it used to be uh, a few years ago when these kinds of conversation didn't even uh, uh, take place. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, the, the hierarchy of the, of, of the judiciary, uh, of course, I mean, you know, uh, you know, appointments always start from, you know, are, are, are from the lower level, right? So if, 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 you know, we look at the Supreme Court, well, you know, the, the, the candidates come from the low, the, the, the other lower level courts. And so, Therefore, in order to uh, uh, be able to ensure a better representation at you know at, at the at that level, then we need uh, a, 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 a competent candidates already at lower levels, uh, lower level courts. And in order to have a, a, a competent co candidates at these lower level courts, then we need competent lawyers, right? Uh, 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 who are you know members of, of, of minority groups who are, are, are aspire are interested and, and can be considered for for uh, for the judiciary so so it, it is really uh, um, a, 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 an effort from the um, uh, 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 from, from the bases uh, and, uh, uh, and, and and that has to to uh, to intensify that there, there's you know there's some improvements here and there that you know we, we hear about uh, uh, in in the news 
Uh, I also, uh, you know, uh, to, just to just to uh, just to conclude, uh, uh, saw um, about a month ago the, min the federal minister of justice uh, actually holding uh, webinars and public events uh, 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 to uh, 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 publicize the government's um, uh, high interest in uh, recruiting uh, candidates from uh, 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 fr from minority groups. And, and that ju just that, although it, it is a modest step, uh, it, it is quite, uh, you know, I was quite surprised by that because, you know, this is not something we would see uh, we would have seen uh, uh, some some years ago. So so things are moving, but but certainly they could be moving uh, uh, much much faster. Thank you, Hanru. Um, the next question is for me, and then we'll just have one question for everyone to wrap it up. So question for me that, that was DM'd through. You run the number one media portfolio for college and Gen Z women. How can we foster better representation and more diversity in the media sphere? This is so important. I think something that is. Um, you know, we are like Hanru, you know, in the legal sector, we're starting to see the needle move here um, with media and representation in Hollywood and um, on air and just in general, which is great to see. Um, I think, like Amy said, there's a lot of steps each of us can take. We all, even if you're not in a super high position of power, you are in a position of power and influence in your circle. Um, I actually want to drop this link in uh, grateful for technology that I can share this link with you all here. This is a really great Harvard Business Review article about interrupting bias. And it's something I think about a lot in my day to day, um, you know, really considering how we can elevate people, underrepresented groups, Asians or otherwise in our workplaces, in our spheres of influence, um, you know, really knowing some of the barriers that face underrepresented people, like having to work twice as hard as other groups other in groups in order to achieve the same outcome or being passed over because people have a bias, which is natural for us as humans um, towards people who are like them, right? So recognizing some of these things and actively combating them, auditing them in yourself and elevating those people who are underrepresented um, is, is really key to this. Um, like I said earlier, I think being proactive, especially in media is in incredibly important. We see so much coverage um, for the Asian community now, um, very um, overdue, but very concentrated right now because of what has been happening in the news and it being Asian History Month. But how can media be more proactive in, again, integrating this into their day-to-day, -day, into just their operational principles? And I think that goes into my last point, which is about just being really intentionally inclusive with everything that we're doing as in media. Um, thinking about you know, who is pictured in the imagery that you select for, um, you know, for your graphics, for the photos that you use, um, for, the, for the talent that you cast for events, right? All of these are decisions that um, if you make based on a knee-jerk reaction, well, your knee-jerk reaction may be to default to what you know, right? And so really being intentional about that, it's something that we care about a lot at Her Campus Media. And, um, you know, we've, we've made efforts to operationalize that inclusivity so that when we're selecting imagery, when we're selecting pop cultural references and things like that, we already have that lens of inclusion built in. So how can we operationalize that and continually audit our own biases so that we can make a difference? And again, like I said, every, every single one of us has power to do that within our spheres and to advocate for our colleagues, to advocate for our direct reports. Um, so yeah, I just encourage you guys to read that article. It's a really, really great one. And I think it has a lot of actionable steps for us to take. So let's wrap up on one question that I love. Um, that I would love for each of the panelists to answer and we can leave on a really inspiring note here. So what has been a key learning moment for you about anti-Asian racism that has empowered or validated yourself? And uh, why don't we start with, with Teresa and then we'll have, hear from each of our panelists and then I'll um, hand it over to our organizers to wrap up for today. But Teresa, would you like to get started with that question? Um, I think, um, uh... What I'm seeing um, now, uh, it's been um, a very difficult, uh, but also in inspirational uh, process the past 12 months. 
uh, and um, uh, it have taken us some time to actually to get over the uh, disbelief and some denial and come to some form of acceptance this is happening. Uh, and, uh, and now people rightly so, so feeling frustrated and ang angry. And those are actually uh, energies uh, that, that we can channel into positive change. And I'm seeing more of that. I'm seeing this event that I'm participating in today. Uh, I have another webinar to promote uh, a set of videos that we just developed to challenge those deep-seated stereotypes this afternoon. And there's a, um, a, a yellow ribbon, uh, uh, Asian gold ribbon campaign happening with the youth summit. So I'm, I'm seeing people are actually now organizing and mobilizing. And uh, so I think, you know, so that, that concept is true and I'm so happy it is true. And uh, I would also like to, to wrap up by saying that, um, uh, you know, you have a focus on policy. Uh, Amy talked about the challenge of getting policy through, but I think that we really at the cusp of actually getting something and, uh, you know, including Asian uh, anti-Asian racism into the uh, anti-racism uh, uh, strategy. Uh, I think race-based data is coming close. Uh, I would also put forward for your consideration uh, as a potential action is to actually urge the government to institutionalize Asian Heritage Month. And, um, uh, you know, in a way that would actually uh, uh, you know, uh, half institutions, the education sector, the arts and culture sector, the public service sector to actually use this um, uh, platform to talk about anti-Asian racism and, uh, and how we can be a more inclusive society. Uh, Han Ru, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um... Yes, that's, um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge all uh, the great comments uh, on the chat. I've, you know, in between question, I tried to, uh, uh, I read all your uh, uh, um, uh, interventions. I'm just uh, really bad at multitasking. So uh, apologize if I um, uh, did not answer or, or react to um, uh, your uh, uh, great comments. Um, well, to answer your 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 question, uh, Annie. Well, I mean, obviously, I've, I've been you know aware, sensitive to uh, you know these these issues for you know for for a long time. And but you know for for a long time also, I I always um, ask myself, you know, how you know can I best contribute to the to the debate. Um, uh, uh, to these to these issues, um, and, and so because of my you know indecisiveness, I, I may not have been as uh, proactive as I as I should. And then I think that was a couple years ago. I um, attended a talk by uh, you know if we stay in the uh, on the on the theme of, of, of the Harvard Business School uh, uh, given by uh, uh, a, a professor at the at the Harvard Business School her name is uh, Laura Huang uh, and I um, I'll, I'll just um, um, post the uh, her website uh, on on the, uh, in the chat and uh, um, and you know I, I, I was super um, inspired by her talk. She's a great lecturer. She, she's a great speaker. So uh, you will, you will, um, uh, you, you can see many of her, uh, of her, of her talks uh, online, just, you know, click anyone, any one of them. And she, uh, she published a, uh, a book uh, back in uh, last year, uh, which is titled Edge Turning Adversity into Advantage. Uh, uh, in which you know she doesn't only she doesn't only she doesn't only um, uh, give uh, advice based on her research uh, about leadership, but also uh, she 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 she, uh, she 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 includes uh, also uh, her personal experiences as a, uh, a, a family coming from you know uh, you know immigrant background uh, from 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 Taiwan. Uh, and so, you know, my, my you know, having heard uh, her speak, reading her, uh, having read her book, uh, you know, I, one of my reactions was was that, uh, you know, if, if if she can do all these 
incredible things and, and get involved uh, uh, in the fight against uh, racism in, in uh, for equality, then certainly there's something I can do, right? Uh, and so uh, that's one moment, a pivotal moment, a uh, recent moment that I uh, that comes to mind uh, uh, with regard to your question. And so that, you know, my recommendation as well. Excellent. Lots of great follow-ups. Thank you, Hanru. And we'll wrap with you, Amy. Any final thoughts? Sure. Just very quickly. And mine is actually a family story. Uh, my niece, who is a physician, actually working on the front line treating COVID patients. And one day she called and she was desperate. She was in tears. She was so upset because of what she sees as the disparities of the white privileged class and the impact on COVID, particularly the racialized communities. They are dying in front of her. So, and of course, her own experience being a young Asian physician, a woman, and has been asked many times, like, where do I get, when do I get to see the real doctor? And, you know, and doctors asking others, when do we see the real Canadian nurses? These are all Asian nurses or racialized nurses. So she was so angry and she wanted to do something. So she started to write and she's contributed to op-eds and all that. This story actually touched me a lot. And it's consistent with the whole last year is those younger voices coming and reaching out, sharing their experiences and wanting to do something. So in my family now, we I recall like we have three gold uh, people, like three women, <laughs> my sister and I and my niece joining this camp of activism. And that gives me hope. That gives me hope that of course it's hard in me is that, you know, for my niece who is always this model minority, you know, working as a physician never really cared so much about social justice issues really turning around and really gives me hope because I'm no longer, I don't feel alone. I don't feel alone. When we were fighting for redress, it was actually a lonely battle until the very, you know, when we were fighting for many of these social justice issues in the last, it was, it felt very lonely. And now I don't feel as alone, particularly amongst the Asian Canadian community, just like what I said about even the Chinese media questioning ourselves, our attitude towards Black Canadians. So I think it's, it's, it really gives me hope, you know, <laughs> to feel not being alone is good. That means there is solidarity, there is com camaraderie, there is the more of us that are willing to do something. And I look to these young people like you and all the people on this call to, to really work together and there is hope and there will be change to come. Thank you all very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Amy. What a great way to wrap up. And I do feel a sense of that solidarity and community with you guys um, in Canada, my, my part of my community as well. So I'll pass it over to Sophia now to wrap up for today. But thank you guys so much for being here. And thank you for allowing me to moderate this great panel. Over to you, Sophia. Thank you so much, Annie. And also thank you so much to all of our amazing panelists. Um, I felt moved. I felt sad at times because um, I really resonate with what all of you said and I really appreciate all the diverse perspe uh, perspectives you brought. So I'm just gonna wrap up by letting you know about part two of our series. Um, I really enjoyed um, what Amy, I think it was maybe also Teresa mentioned about how you know us as young people, um, a way you can get involved is by honing in, honing in on your craft. So this is a collaborative event between the Global Shapers community, Triple C Collective and Threading Change. And we'll be hosting part two of this event next Thursday from five to 8 uh, p.m. Pacific or eight to 11 Eastern. And it's our artist showcase stream where we have three hours of Asian artists and allies come together and perform rap, dance, hula hooping, um, singing, spoken poetry, um, all the good stuff. And this event is also when we will be um, announcing winners for our various uh, raffle bundle prizes. And we'll also represent this from Hua Foundation, one of our um, do donees we're giving money to talk about their experience as well. It should be a really, really invigorating and interesting event. You can drop in if you paid for the raffle, would be good to come so you can see if you want. If you want to register, you can go to this link right here, bit.ly slash, oh, it's not showing up for some reason. Um, bit.ly slash uh, ANHM livestream. And we really look forward to having you there. We hope you got something out of the session today. And thank you so much for coming to our event. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, all of you. You too.